Hey. So, I've been wanting to do this video for a little while now. But before I go ahead and jump on in, please, 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 don't forget to lightly tap that subscribe button. Everybody's always saying smash that subscribe button. You gotta give it a little love. Give it a little tender love and care, you know what I'm saying? So, without further ado, guys, this is my top five myths or misconceptions, I suppose you could say, regarding tarantulas. So, grab your snacks, grab a seat, and enjoy. So one myth or misconception I hear from a lot of folks is that tarantulas don't build webs. Quite a few of them actually do. However, unlike with true spiders, the majority of which use their webs as a means to capture prey, tarantulas use it as more of a way to build a home for themselves. Now the silk is of course still going to be sticky, prey can still get caught in it, but rather than envenomate the prey item after it's been caught, and then step back for them to take effect before returning to feed, tarantulas will wait by the entrance of their webs, usually with their front legs sticking out, and will then grab their prey once it wanders by, using their chelicerae, or their jaws, and a combination of brute strength and venom to subdue and overpower the prey. And they do it right on the spot. They don't attack, retreat, and wait for the venom to take effect. So, they still create webs, just not in the traditional sense of like your common garden orb weaver or black widow or those type of spiders. So, another one I hear often is that tarantulas are desert spiders. Now, some of them are, but not all. Tarantulas or theraphosids, as they are known to science as, are found across the globe in a myriad of environments, ranging from arid desert regions to more tropical regions such as rainforests. Some make their home on the ground beneath fallen debris, others construct deep intricate burrows beneath the surface of the ground or between rocks and crevices, and still others have adapted to life in the trees, where they construct thick tube-shaped webs that they reside in. I think that when most of the general population pictures a tarantula, they picture an A. Chalcodes or a B. Smithi or something like that, both of which are New World terrestrial slash opportunistic burrowing species. Both of these tarantulas have the typical New World terrestrial build with a large round abdomen, short thick legs, and this gives the spider a very stocky sort of build. However, an arboreal tarantula, such as this A. avicularia, commonly known as the pink toe, has a much lighter build, with a smaller body and much longer legs than your typical terrestrial. In addition, arboreal tarantulas, such as this one, have these special foot pads that almost have a velcro-like sort of grip to them, very similar to that of a gecko. This allows them to be able to climb up smooth vertical surfaces much more effectively than their ground dwelling counterparts. Now, terrestrial tarantulas do still have this feature. However, the foot pads are much broader on arboreal species, and this gives the legs a much flatter appearance than with a terrestrial, and likewise allows them to climb much more efficiently. Now with number three, I've heard a couple different variations of this one. Of course, none of these are correct, and that is that tarantulas are either not venomous or that their venom is no stronger than a bee sting. Now, before we get into explanations here, notice I used the word venomous, not poisonous. I know I am probably nitpicking here, but hey, it's what I do. Anyway, poisons have to be ingested. And while I have seen people do some ridiculous and often reckless things with their tarantulas, I have yet to actually see or hear of anyone attempting to drink their spider's venom. So venom has to be injected into the bloodstream of another organism in order to do its job, 
which is to immobilize whatever it is that the animal is eating. Hence why even tarantulas that are known for being highly defensive would much rather flee than to waste their venom trying to bite something several times their own size and that they can't even eat. Venom is also far more complex in its chemical structure than most poisons are. Hence why certain proteins inspire venom have actually been used in medical science to benefit humans. For example, the venom of the Brazilian water inspire has been known to give male victims as well as females, although in a much different way that I will leave to your imagination, painful and long-lasting erections. The protein that causes this symptom is a key ingredient found in Viagra and other similar drugs. I know I've kind of gone off the rail a little here with this one, but you know, food for thought. So New World tarantulas, that is those species found throughout North, Central, and South America, generally have much milder venom than their old world counterparts. This generally only creates local swelling and will usually subside in a matter of hours, unless of course you happen to be allergic. A lot of these species possess what are called urticating hairs, which are a patch of barbed hairs that the spider kicks into the air when threatened. And if lodged into a victim's skin, nostrils, or even their eyes, can create intense itching, irritation, and temporary blindness. Old world tarantulas, those that hail from Asia, Africa, and Australia, lack these hairs, and thus make up for it by having a much stronger venom. Severity varies from genus to genus, but the Pocolotheria genus of India and Sri Lanka, as well as some of the baboon spiders of Africa, can most certainly put a human in the hospital with their bite. Keep in mind there are no records of a person ever having died from being bit by one of these. But with symptoms like painful muscle cramps, vomiting, and even heart palpitations, it's probably an experience you want to avoid. Now, as I said before, these animals do not seek out and hunt humans, so they'd much prefer to flee rather than resort to using their venom. However, they do demand respect and are definitely not suitable for handling. Number two. Okay, we're getting there, we're getting there. All tarantulas are big. So, Five to six inches is considered pretty average for the majority of theraphosids, which is still pretty dang big for a spider. Some, however, do get even larger, with some of the Asian arboreals attaining lake spans of seven to nine inches, and many of the large South American species known as bird eaters get even more massive, some exceeding 10 inches in lake span. But there are quite a few smaller species as well. Males of some of the baboon species don't get any larger than 2 to 3 inches in leg span. There are also dwarf species, such as the Trinidad olive or the pumpkin patch. Both of these spiders rarely exceed 3 inches in leg span, with spiderlings starting out super duper teeny tiny. To give you an idea of scale, the wolf spiders here in Florida are around the same size sometimes even larger depending on the species and the individual in question. Number one, tarantulas can be defamed. Ugh. Look, don't ever try to do this to your tarantula. It will not appreciate it. If you were to remove your tarantula's fangs, you would be essentially taking away its ability to immobilize its prey and defend itself should the prey item attempt to fight back. Also, its ability to properly digest and consume its food would be severely inhibited by this. Like all spiders, tarantula's mouth parts consist of its chelicerae, which are basically its jaws, both of which end in a long, curved fang. In tarantulas, when the fangs are not in use, these stay folded underneath the spider's body. The digestive process begins when the spider first grabs its prey, sinking its veins into the body and gripping it with its chelicerae. The spider injects its venom through tiny holes at the ends of its veins, much like a hypodermic needle. This immobilizes the prey and softens its tissue from the inside out, thus beginning the digestive process. The spider then regurgitates its digestive enzymes into its prey, and uses a combination of this chemical cocktail as well as mechanical actions known as maceration, 
which is a fancier way of describing how the spire chews to break down the solid prey item into a tasty liquid meal, which it then slurps through its stomach, which acts much like a vacuum. Tiny hairs between the jaws help filter out solid parts, such as wings, legs, scales, and fur that the spire isn't able to consume. What's left is a tiny ball consistent of all of these undigestible parts known as a bolus. It's sort of like an owl pellet. So yeah, let your spire keep its fangs. Well, that about wraps up for this one, guys. Don't forget my arachnoholics. Drop a comment down below. I always love hearing from you guys. Let me know what you thought of this video. If there's something that you felt I may have left out, or if you feel like I covered everything and you just really enjoyed the content. Either way, I always love hearing from you guys, and I will see you in the next one. Stay awesome.